my name is Anna Hicks and this is my dog Noodle. Now today, Noodle and I are going to be interviewing my boss, Mike Spivey, the founder and CEO of Spivey Consulting Group. But in order to make it a little bit more fun, we're gonna make it a bit of a game. Basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to Noodle's favorite dog park and we're gonna play fetch because Noodle is really great at fetch. I think somewhere in her mutt mix, there must be some sort of retreat for probably a pretty big park, right Noodle? That's right. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna each throw the ball, both Mike and I, for every question. Now, if Mike throws it farther, then we just move on to the next question. If I throw it farther, then I get to ask another question that gets even more personal. Now, because I'm not quite as athletic as Mike, I wasn't a varsity baseball star in high school, I get a little bit of a handicap. I'm gonna get to use a chuck it. So we'll see who can throw it farther. Me with a chuck it or Mike unaided. At the end of the game, we're gonna see who tires out first, Noodle or Mike. If Mike gets tired first, then Noodle gets a bunch of treats as a prize. If Noodle gets tired first, she still gets a bunch of treats because regardless, she's a really good dog. So let's get started. Let's head to the dog park. All right, Noodle, you wanna play? Drop it. Good girl. <laughs> I can, yeah, I can throw that far. It's funny how bad they are. Like, <laughs> their brains are like... All right, Mike. We'll start with an easy one. Okay. Where? How did you get into admissions? Uh, it was by chance. I went to Vanderbilt to get my uh, doctorate degree in higher education leadership. And as part of that process, I think they stuck me in, in a place somewhere, like doctoral students work. And I was like, or I don't know, somehow I got started at Vanderbilt Law School as a, you know, 2000 as in a missions file reader. Let's see if I can beat, beat how far you threw it. Yeah, I think that's definitely farther. Before you got into admissions, you did your doctoral work in goal setting. That's right. Why did you choose that field? Uh, God, these are good questions. Um, incidentally, if you have a a law school interview and they ask you a question you want to think about for a second say these are good questions so initially my uh i was at georgia tech in uh, human organizational behavior so i had to have some sort of um human behavioral psychological component it was in the business school but it was partially housed in the school of psychology and goal setting motivation type stuff had been thing because of my background with sports and particularly track in track you set goals for you know precise goals if you try to beat them. So it was something that interested me. I'm not really putting as much I'm getting my shoulder or rest. Alright, what do you think, Mike? I couldn't I wasn't paying attention. I think you probably beat me on the side. I think we're we're tied one one to one. Okay. Yeah. So because you threw less far on that one, we have another question for you, which okay, is okay. we're gonna stay on the topic of goal setting. So what is the biggest goal you've ever set for yourself but failed to attain? Biggest goal I've ever set for myself and failed to attain. Um, I wanted to be a college president. I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah, looks like you changed that goal. Yeah, right. I fear not that bad. So you've talked a lot in the past about how you first got into admissions consulting in part because you were seeing a ton of misinformation being traded online and wanted to help the applicant pool as a whole to be better informed. When you were first starting out, what was the number one most common misconception you saw being stated as fact yeah, online? Yeah, I mean, it was stated as fact all the time that schools average, which I don't know a single school that's ever had, you, you wouldn't take the time in law school admissions to do this, the schools average LSAT scores. That actually was the case earlier uh, than when I started the company because before school, US News did average all the law scores. So that's what schools cared about. But there were so many people online saying like you should only take the LSAT once. It was malpractice. It was costing people are saying it with like authority. You know, it's costing students um, their dream schools, or it's mm -hmm. costing students hundreds of thousands of dollars of the scholarship. And it took us as a firm literally like five or six years of just having to repeat and give the reasons why that wasn't the case. And now finally, like you don't, you hardly ever see that anymore. Yeah. And even yeah. though it's still on some like, well, I won't say the schools, but still on a few schools websites that we, you know, they, they do see all score, scores. So sometimes schools will say we look at all scores, but they don't average. They, they care about the high score. 
you haven't you didn't bring a napkin. Okay, so you've had at least one prominent inter internet stalker since starting Spivey <laughs> Consulting. I have had. Someone who pretended to be you on social media and harassed you on various platforms about the infamous counter cycle. Apart from that, have you had any really out there experiences with law school applicants online and what happened? Not so much online. I mean, look, if you're going to be doing things, you're going to get people who pay attention. Not me, but you all as when you're lawyers and then when you do things online, people have the anonymity of, you know, of, of whatever name they give themselves online. So you'll have people that um, accuse you of things or, or, you know, say funny, you know, fake things about you. They, they'll, they'll take pictures of your head and disembody it from your body and show it being thrown <laughs> off of buildings. Uh, one year they had a theory that if they threw me in a volcano and they would get their LSAT scores back. <laughs> so that was a big thing. Um, other than that one, I think you used the word prominent. Other than that prominent <laughs> stalker that it became a big deal, um, I haven't had anyone paying, I think, undue attention. We sort of get that there's going to some be a, a small percentage of people every year that sort of uh, pick on us, and it's, it's totally normal. So you've written on your personal blog, spivyblog.com, about how you were a shy, introverted child, but you very intentionally made a shift toward being outgoing and extroverted as a tween and a teen. For those of us who may still be introverts and not necessarily wanting to try to change that, what lessons do you think we can or should learn from our more extroverted counterparts? Okay, that's a, that's a really good question. I'm gonna do a different kind of throw. This is called a crow hop. Okay. okay this is, I played center field, so this is how we do it. I don't know, you're interfering with my, I never had a dog when I was <laughs> dog, That one should be a little further. Oh yeah, that was a far one. Yeah. Um, well, to begin with, there's, I mean, I have many friends who are introverts. Uh, the, I co-parented my dog, Bear Bear, and my dog's mother, Jennifer, is incredibly introverted. And obviously there's nothing wrong with being introverted. What happened with me is I just, um, it, it was, I, I'm sure it wasn't overnight, but it felt like an overnight experience where I, I decided that I was going to be like outgoing and talk to strangers and talk to people in my school. And I had been very shy. Um, I guess what I would say is this, there are times in your life where it very much pays off, even if you're introverted, to get to know people because you get more information. A classic example of data message program. So you, you don't have to like change your personality overnight, but I think th the older you get, the more um, you recognize that people aren't really judging you because they're more thinking about themselves, right? So in admitted students programs, if you want to raise a, a question in, with around 100 people and ask it, 99, 95 people in that room will be wondering whether they should be asking your, their question versus judging you for asking your question. So in situations like that, when you need information, I think it's helpful to understand that you're probably not being judged as much as you might think you are. If there was one thing you could change about your personality right now, you'd wake up tomorrow oh and God. be different. What would it be and why? Um. I guess I, I wish I'd, I would, I worry, uh, I, there's a parade of maladies that I worry about for my business, for the, uh, more importantly, for the people close in my life, for people like you, Anna. Um, and it's good to plan and it's good to have backup plans, but I, I'm a very frequent worrier. I worry about a lot of things a lot of the time. I don't, I don't sleep nearly as much as most people, you know that. Um, the, so the brain doesn't stop spinning because it's always thinking about worst case scenarios. Noodle, bring it here. Drop it. Good girl. All right, so Noodle's torn up the ball a little bit, which will mess with its aerodynamics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're, we're gonna get a little more personal here. I, th that one was pretty personal. We're gonna keep getting personal. Okay. Um, so you just turned 48 and you've never been married and never had biological non-reddit children right, in the context of our society where most people do get married why do you think it is that you haven't you know that's a good question i used to get asked this on dates too um, which is a funny question when you're on a date with someone and they're like why haven't you already been married you don't know whether they take that as like a compliment like you seem like a nice person or like a, like a put down you know the societal need to um say you should do this in your relationship has never for whatever reason we all have our insecurities but that's not one that's ever like triggered me to be insecure 
I think being with the right person is much more important than having a label. Uh, you mentioned biological children. Um, if I'm a right with the right person and we have the right dog or we adopt the right kid, awesome. Um, but it, again, that's, I would rather, uh, I think that's putting the, I think people put the, the cart before the horse sometimes because of societal pressures. I think that was farther than my last one. Okay. Good. So, Good. I'm that one you don't have question. to answer. <laughs> Uh-oh. Noodle, you ruined this ball so we can't relate. So, from your work in admissions, to your work in law school career services, to your consulting work, you've met thousands of applicants and law students who have gone on to careers both as attorneys and in other fields. What trends have you noticed in those who end up becoming the most successful? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked that. Um, and for the record, I didn't know what quite any of the questions coming <laughs> at me. Um, so I was a dean of career services during the Great Recession, when you know, 20%, 25% of the students were getting jobs, 75% were graduating without any job opportunities. And the I, I, I learned pretty quickly that the ones that the of the 75% that were graduating without jobs, the ones that I knew I didn't have to worry about after graduation, the ones that I knew within two to three months were gonna call me and be like, Dean Spivey, you know, I got it. Hogan Lovell has finally returned my call. Were the ones that were ebullient and upbeat through the process. They didn't get beat down by the fact that, you know, in today's world, we're so, so used to responsivity. And law school admissions, as people have seen, takes time. Job searches, for sure, can take time. But for 90, not, you know, 95 percent of the people out there, you're going to get a job, and that first job could re could lead to awesome career tracks. We talked earlier. Like my first job was a file reader, and then I got to be, you know, a, a assistant dean of multiple law school, start my own consulting firm. It just doesn't happen overnight. The people who stay upbeat, and positive, and professional versus feeling like they're victims, uh, um, almost all, I, I would say, quite frankly, always come out fine. I know it's kind of gross now. All right. Well, that was a definite loss because of your handicap of the ball being destroyed. Of all of the law school applicants you've ever met, can you identify one favorite and tell us about them? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot. There was a woman from Russia, Mariana, who's a lawyer in DC now, who was just like so, um, outgoing in a caring way like you could tell that she cared about you and she didn't want to like pressure you to admit her we ended up admitting admitting her to Vanderbilt Law School where she went um and she was just you know an admissions superstar for the law for the admissions team uh there's a guy who's the general counsel for a, a huge university now I'm not going to say his name since he's, he has a prominent position but he was like Mr. Cool and Mr. like sports star and like never had to do this but as a here's why i bring this up as a 3l I mean, he was like a former athlete and also like a really awesome law student as a 3l he came in and did a phonathon where he called and admitted students for us the point being there is it was always one else that did that it was never he was the only 3l that ever did that because by then they had sort of checked out about having helping admissions there, there are too many to count those are just two stories but there are hundreds and, and, and there are hundreds i stay in touch with Okay, that's not even a ball anymore. We, I'm gonna go get a backup. We've gotten our backup ball. <laughs> Come on, Noodle. See? This one's heavier, so it'll go farther. Oh, interesting. So that one went pretty far. All right. Okay. Yeah, I'm not gonna throw it that far. So a personal question is gonna be coming up soon. <laughs> so anyone who has you on social media knows that you are exceptionally athletic and you're a pretty remarkably healthy eater as well. Do you think you prioritize health and fitness over other values one might have, like fun, relaxation, or balance? And if so, why? So I've been traveling for two weeks and I haven't particularly been e eating healthy. Um, so I, this is funny because I don't feel like a healthy eater, but when I'm in Colorado where I live and when I'm in a routine, I do eat very healthy. I eat mostly uh, vegan. Um, and then I trail run all, six days a week and lift about two days a week. Why do I prioritize that and would there be other things I'm putting over it? Well, the, the, the exercise in particular, um, when I'm running, it's the only time my brain shuts off or I mean, I try, I've tried meditation, so it gets a little bit like that. So when I'm running, I'm not like, I'm not spinning around. How could this 
Apple can't get in tr you know, trouble with the way they worded one sentence in their character and fitness statement. Is it misleading? Does it make them sound like the incident was worse than it is? These kinds of thoughts are in my head like 23, seven. <laughs> and that one hour when I'm running is when they're not in my head. So I would say prioritizing that has been really good for me as far as finding a, a way to relax. Are there other things I could prioritize? Of course, when I was a kid, I was a, a, you know, a constant reader. I read two to three books probably a week. I mean, I was a kid, so they were little books. So probably more than that. And I don't read nearly as much as I used to. You know, choose your poison. I see Bill Gates reads six books. He reads a lot faster than I would anyways. Reads six books a week. Um, that's probably how he winds down, and I will wind down by running in the mountains. Yeah, I'm not gonna get this one as far as you're laughing. Crawl. Close, but not quite, right? Yeah, it's close, but not. Oh, wait, actually, it went farther, but we're gonna ask you this question anyway. So, if we walked over to the track over in this complex right now, right. how fast could you run a mile? A mile? So, that would be four laps uh, in these shoes and in this weird sweater. Six fifteen, maybe six minute. How fast could you run one lap? Yeah, so that's what I was a sprinter. So, so a lap is a, is a, a four hundred, four forty in football terms. So a quarter of a mile. Yeah, a quarter of a mile. My fastest ever was forty was forty seven seconds. Um, I now maybe fifty nine seconds. All right, noodle, come here, come here, give me the ball. You recently told me that you can't recall ever doing homework during high school. That's true. And yet you went to Vanderbilt for college. Clearly you're an intelligent guy with a lot of strengths, but I think you would agree that standards for getting into elite colleges have raised significantly in the past 30 years. Do you think this is a good thing or a bad thing and why? That's a really good question. To be fair, that's, that's right. The admit rate at Vanderbilt University when I went to was like 49% when I went there. And I'm sure I did homework, it's just not a, it never formed as a memory. Um, there's no way I would get into Vanderbilt now with their whatever, 8%, they'll, they'll fact check, 7% of mid rate. Um, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think access to education, it, it, it's one of the three pillars of higher education and access to education is a really good thing. So I think we need, as, as we have, uh, the ability for, for, you know, people from all different backgrounds, all different challenges, health challenges, uh, socioeconomic challenges to be able to go go into higher education. Um, I, 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 I'm a, how to say this? I think that competition is not necessarily the evil that some people make out make it out to be. So if Princeton undergrad is admitting three percent instead of twenty percent, I don't necessarily see that as bad or good. I think it sees I see this as sort of the evolution of the of the of the top of the higher ed pyramid in a larger market. Let's see if you have to answer question number two. Okay. I think, I think we, I think you have to answer that one. Okay. Tell us one of your craziest stories from college. <laughs> oh my God. I mean, there's, there's so many to count. Um, we're going to edit this out if this could possibly get me in trouble, but I can't imagine it could. So when I went to Vanderbilt, if anyone's familiar with Nashville or Vanderbilt, they have a lot, a real live replica of the Parthenon. I hope my mom doesn't watch this. Um, right near Vanderbilt's campus. So it's the Parthenon in Greece. It's the same exact dimensions. When I was at Vanderbilt, they were refurbishing it. So they had scaffolding on each end. And what we would do is we would go at nighttime and me and my friends, and we would climb up the scaffolding and sit on the roof, which is like angled. And there was a park ranger, so you'd see his car or her car on one side, so you'd sit on the other side of the roof. Keep in mind, the roof is like way up there. And then, you know, you'd see them moving, that you'd see, like you'd be sitting there and all of a sudden you'd see like a car coming, it would be the park ranger. This is like a one in the morning. So we would scurry <laughs> to the other side of the roof so the park ranger would never see us. We would hang out there once until like the ROTC kids were running it, the ROTC kids were running like 6 a.m. We hung out all night. <laughs> That's hilarious. All right, I love that. Right. I'm sure you could have. Okay. All right. So in one of your 
recent Spivey blog posts, you talk about your high school girlfriend and how you truly loved each other and had a strong relationship. I already know where this is going. Have you seen her since you broke up? Oh, <laughs> because I don't even think about it in those terms, breakup. Have I seen my high school girlfriend? Yes, I saw her um, 10 years ago at, at my 20 year high school reunion. I know why you asked this question because I'm going to see her in about two, two hours from now. You're going to see your high school girlfriend Thanks two hours from now? i you don't know that. I'm Anna. shocked. <laughs> right. Um, and that's kind of cool. That's a good one. That is a good one. I think Alex is going to be impressed. I think Alex will be impressed too. One thing I think some adults struggle with is keeping and maintaining strong friendships. You seem to have a lot of meaningful, loving friendships. Do you have any tips for keeping up high quality friendships as an adult? Um, yeah, I never thought about it in those terms that there are people in my life who are very important to, to me, obviously. Um, I mean, I don't know if this is a tip because it's so obvious, but we're so busy in today's world that everything is about prioritization. So there, you know, you said a lot, but I actually think my inner circle of like close, close friends has shrunk a lot since college to maybe 10, 15 people. But those 10, 15 people certainly are a priority. Um, and I make them a priority, so if they call, I call them back that day. Um, you know, there's where I live, there's someone that lives 30 minutes from me, and I make the time to go down there and do things that she, that's important to her. Um, um, so, yeah, I'm, there's, there, are, there are a lot of people uh, who have touched my life. Now there's a smaller number that are still a part of my life. And um, I very much try to make them a priority. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I do. I, th I do think most people would say ten to fifteen close friends as an adult is a lot. Okay. All right, we'll call that one a win. We're going to ask you the question that is asked sometimes at the end of some law school interviews, which is, "Do you have anything else you'd like to add? Is there anything that you wish I'd asked?" Um. Yeah, that is that is asked often. There's nothing that I wish you had asked. There's, I will add one thing, which is as follows. No one's life, in the history of the world, no one's life has gone like this. So we're always going to have ups and downs. And the law school admissions process is just one of those like microcosms of life. You're going to have ups and downs in the law school admissions process. It's not going to go away. The job search thing is, is this, but times two. You'll be in the hallway and you'll see people in business suits. You won't be in a business suit because you don't have an OCI interview that day. And it'll feel like, the, the, to some people, the end of the world. Like, how, how am I going to, where am I going to go from here? I don't have a job interview. That's not just law school. That's going to be the next 60, 70 years. I've had some really bad days with health issues. Um, I had like a six month period where I have a jaw issue where I could hardly, you, you know it, Anna, I could hardly talk. I couldn't smile at people. It's hard to be really upbeat when you can't talk for six months. Yeah. So what I try to do is days like today where I can throw a ball and um, live my life. I try to like live in the moment and sort of maximize the, the good days. I don't know if that's good advice or not. If you enjoyed this, please subscribe. Feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel and there's also links to various places below. Thanks for watching. Thank you.